Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with us to Acts chapter 24. Today we're going to talk about God's timetable. You know, God's timetable is not like our timetable. And how many know that God doesn't have to check in with you on when he can visit you? <laughs> he can interrupt your schedule anytime he thinks is appropriate, and it's always for your good. Never for anything evil, it's always for your good to make something beautiful out of your life. Part of our problem is, is we can procrastinate on what God has asked us to do or on that appointment. Today we're going to talk about a fellow in Acts chapter 24 who procrastinated. Now I know none of you out there have procrastinated, but uh, we'll share about somebody who did procrastinate. <laughs> By the way, I have good news for you. There is a rehab now opening for procrastination in Vancouver. They just haven't opened it yet, but it is on its way, uh, an official rehab center. By the way, do you know why the procrastinator became an artist? Because they prefer to draw things out. <laughs> These are preacher jokes, can you tell? What's a procrastinator's favorite condiment? Ketchup. <laughs> they said procrastination is like a credit card. It's a lot of fun until you get the bill. <laughs> All right, enough of those. Let's get into the message this morning. And we are in Acts chapter 24. I encourage you, if you have not already done so, download the Coastal Church app because the notes are there. We don't always cover everything, but it's there to help you. Also, an amazing blog. Pastor Jess has a great blog about how to minister to children. So you won't want to miss that, especially if you have children or grandchildren, nieces or nephews. She's got a great blog waiting there for you. We pick up the story in Acts chapter 24. Paul has left Jerusalem and he's on his way to Caesarea. So let me put up a, a map here or a picture of Caesarea. And this is what it would have looked like at the time. Paul, as you know from last week's message, he left Jerusalem at night with a guarded escort because they were after his life. The religious Jewish people wanted him dead, and so the commander said, we're going to give you an escort. So he had an armed escort down to Caesarea. And as they go to Caesarea, he comes into this place, and it's, it's quite a town, you guys. If you come to Israel, if you ever go to Israel, you might visit Caesarea. You'll see the duck work to still there, the water ducks they had, the ruins of these places that are on this picture are still there today. I share this because this isn't some fable. This is real history that we're reading about, studying about today. And Caesarea was an amazing city. Vancouver's a nice town. Caesarea was a really nice place on the Mediterranean Ocean, beautiful beaches. They had great entertainment. They had a Roman theater. They had a Greek amphitheater. They had a forum. They had a hippodrome for races. They were into races. They had temples. They had an aqueduct. Really good engineering, bringing water from mountains miles away. So it was, it was a modern city. And this is where Paul is taken into custody. Up here we have a palace that Herod had built. Herod had a number of different palaces. This is one of the palaces that Herod had built. And in that palace is a praetorium, which was a place to keep prisoners or people in custody. And that's where Paul ends up. Paul ends up here in our story. Oh, by the way, he also, he, see here they have a yacht club at this place. They're going to bring a beautiful yacht in there, lighthouse. So quite a town. Paul spends two years. So Acts 24 is a period of two years. And we're going to talk about Paul being in this praetorium here at the palace and being investigated. Now, as the story picks up, he goes there, and when he arrives there, Ananias is the high priest. Ananias is after him. He's only been there five days, and then Ananias shows up with a very high-priced lawyer. His name is Tertullum. He comes in there, and they get a meeting with the governor. The governor's name is Felix. Not Felix the cat, Felix the governor. So Felix is there. And he comes before him, high-priced lawyer. The lawyer is a flatterer. He's a sycophant. And he says to Felix, Oh, Felix, you are just the best governor we ever had. You bring us peace. You bring us prosperity. You are so good. Blah, 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 blah. Well, he wasn't any of that. 
he was a hardened man, and he had recently killed hundreds of Jews, took all their belongings, gave them to wealthy Romans. There's a lot of other things that he did, so this guy's just buttering up this governor. He says, we have a problem with Paul. Paul is a troublemaker, and he profaned the temple. That was the big accusation. And so Paul gets to get up and defend himself, and uh, as, as he does, and he says, you know, um, I'll, I'll start by giving my testimony, which we know Paul did. We studied the power of a testimony last week. Now, Paul's giving his testimony to this high-powered governor, and he says, the charges aren't true. Here's my testimony. Here's what I did. If they're saying I profaned the temple, they have no proof of it, nor did I do that. So, what does the governor to do? He says, well, I'll wait for the commander to come up. The lawyer had lied. The lawyer had said, Paul caused such a ruckus, and there was such a mob that the, we had, we were, it was overpowering the commander. It was the other way around. The commander had to come and rescue Paul. So anyhow, it was all spun, and he had to straighten it out. And Paul is in his defense. In all of these situations, Paul tells the truth, but he's always very respectful and very courteous to these people that he's talking to. So he gives them his story, and the commander says, we'll wait for, or the governor says, we'll wait for the commander to come. And so the commander shows up, and then now they're meeting with this commander present, but also Felix brings his wife to the meeting. He said, well, why would a governor bring his wife to the meeting? He brings his wife to the meeting because her name is Trusilla. This is a very political family deal. You see, Drusilla is the sister to Herod Agrippa, the king, and her older sister is Bernice. We'll find about them in just a minute. So it's a political move as well. Drusilla's there. We'll learn more about her later. She's quite a character, as is Felix. And so they come there. And now Paul is before them. Paul, when he was here, Felix gives them some privileges. He can have visitors and so forth. And really for Paul, it's a bit of a break, I think. Because as you know, he's been on three mission trips, traveling, 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 writing, taking care of people, going through a lot of trials. And he's got basically a break here. He's got some freedom. He can have guests coming and going. We know that during this time he wrote Colossians, he wrote Ephesians, probably Philemon, and some think Hebrews might have been written by him if he wrote it, we don't know for sure, but he was busy during this time. Well, after he gets in front of Felix with Drusilla there, he confronts Felix, and he tells the governor in his talk, he said he reasoned with him, and he covers three topics with this man. He covers the topic of righteousness, self-control, and judgment. We'll find a little later, that's a really gutsy thing to do. After talking to him, Felix begins to tremble. Now he could have just said, away with this man, kill him. He doesn't do that. He just says to him, it's not convenient for me to hear anything more. I'll call you back when I want to. He calls him back a number of times later, but the primary reason was he wanted to give, have Paul give him some money. So he's there for two years in this place. Felix is the governor. Now Nero says, Felix, time to come back to Rome. So Felix gets called back and Festus shows up. So now Festus is a new governor. So Festus says, hey, I got a VIP prisoner. What am I supposed to do with him? So he does some research on his own, goes to Jerusalem, comes back, and says, yeah, you know what, I don't know. I can't find any charge against this guy. He, he's, he's preaching about Jesus being raised from the dead and so forth, but that's not really a criminal charge. Well, who shows up but King Agrippa? King Agrippa brings his sister, Bernice. So Agrippa and Bernice show up. And he says to the king, Festus, you know, Felix was here, he left me this prisoner, I've done some research, and I don't think the guy has done anything that's, well, matter of fact, if I write up a ticket for him, I don't even know what to put on it, I don't know what the charges are. 
kind of you getting a ticket from a police officer and the police officer says, well, I want to give you a ticket, but I don't know what to charge you, but I, I just want to charge you. <laughs> and so you want to charge Paul, but there's nothing we can write on the ticket. So Agrippa says, well, I'd like to hear this guy myself. And so now there's a meeting to get together with Festus, Agrippa, and Bernice. And that brings us, now we're into, we're moving right along. Now we're into chapter 26. And so Paul, again, he tells his testimony. We learned that last week, the power of your testimony. In your testimony, you tell what your life was like before Christ. You tell about what your life, how you found Christ. And you tell about what the difference is made. So that's what he does for this audience. He shares his story again. And when he tells King Agrippa this in chapter 26, Verse 17 and 18, he's recounting what Jesus says to him. And he says, I, Jesus speaking to him, says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from Gentiles, whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And in verse 19, he says, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to your heavenly vision. He says, I taught them. I taught people that Christ would suffer. They'd be first to rise from the dead. He'd proclaim light to the Jewish people and then to the Gentiles. And when he said this, Festus, the governor, he jumps up and says with a loud voice, loud voice. And this, this is a, oh, where did the praetorium go? We'll put that back up here. It's a big deal. Big courtyard. High-end people. Powerful people. Festus, the governor, this is bothering him. He says with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. <laughs> Another lesson is, Paul, you're crazy. <laughs> but he says, I am not afraid, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. Truth and reason. You know, the gospel makes sense. It's not just some fly-by-night myth. It makes sense. And God's okay with you reasoning, thinking this through. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escape his attention. Since this was not done in a corner. This was out in the open. The, tone, the, stu, the, the stone in front of the tomb rolled away for everybody to see. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Paul says to him. The guy's gutsy. He says to the king, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, listen to this. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Wow. So, get the picture. You got King Agrippa, Governor Festus, you got Bernice there, and they have a huddle. They say, let's go over to the chambers. So they go to the chambers and they say to each other, the guy's pretty smart. He's well read, well spoken, well traveled. He's a brilliant man. All he's saying is that the prophets and what Moses said was fulfilled in Christ. But he's, he hasn't done anything worthy of death. If we send him back, what, what are the charges we're going to bring? We can't, we can't let him go. And they say, well, I don't think he's done anything worthy of death. So they, they come back and they say, look, had you not appealed to Caesar, you'd be a free man. But because you appealed to Caesar, you're going to Rome. So the next chapter, Paul now is on his way to Rome. He knew he had to go to Rome, not really the way he planned it, but he's on his way to Rome. I want to go back in our story to the account of him facing Governor Felix. Let's go back to Felix. And I want to share with you a couple things today. One, God appoints the times. Two, God appoints the messenger. And three, God appoints the message. And then lastly... God has an appointment with you personally, one-on-one, -on -one, that's already in the calendar. So let me talk first of all about how God appoints the times. In Ecclesiastes, ask these, chapter 3, verse 11, we read, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. Would you say that with me today? Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. That's God's plan. That's his end. That's what he wants to do. He wants to make everything beautiful in its own time. He wants to make your life beautiful. He wants to make the world beautiful. That's what God has in mind. He has planted eternity into the heart, into the human heart. 
We have that in our heart. We come hardwired from the factory with a desire for eternity. You can go to any period of history, any part of the earth, any part of this planet, and people know that there must be something more after I die. It's in our heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. We could give you other scriptures, but God has appointed the times. He can interrupt your schedule. After all, think about the characters in the Bible. He interrupted Moses while Moses was taking care of sheep. He interrupted Elisha while Elisha was plowing the field. He interrupted Mary. Think of Mary, a young teenager, had her own ideas about a wedding. Boy, did that get changed. <laughs> he interrupted her schedule. He interrupted Peter and Andrew while they were fishing. He interrupted them. He interrupted Matthew while he was collecting taxes. He interrupted the Good Samaritan while he was on the road. He interrupts people. He interrupted Paul on his road to persecute Christians. He was interrupted. And he interrupts Felix. Felix gets interrupted here. Just remember that interruption is just God's invitation to do something greater with your life. Anytime he interrupts your life, it's never for less. It'll always be for more. And if you follow Jesus, you won't be the same you won't find your life becoming what you thought it would be. It'll be better than what you thought it could be. If I think back to the times when God has interrupted our lives, he interrupted my life when I was just out of school working for an oil company in downtown Calgary, walking down 8th Avenue Mall. I met a friend of mine and he said, let's go for lunch. Went for lunch the next day. He told me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God interrupted my life. My life changed after that. That day there on that mall, my life was interrupted. My life was interrupted when God tapped on our shoulders and said, we want you to leave your work in the oil companies for a while and go to Tennessee to do something like the school of missions we have. We were busy in our careers. It was good. It was set. He interrupted our lives and sent us to Tennessee for a year. I wouldn't give that year up for anything. He interrupted our lives. It wasn't for less, it was for more. We came back and we're working in different places and, and uh, I ended up being a consultant and I remember sitting when we were drilling wells for mobile oil in southern Saskatchewan and I was having poached eggs in Elida, Saskatchewan in a little cafe. It's such a rundown building, you could see the light through the cracks in the door. And uh, sitting there, and I had my consultant friend say to me, the guy I worked with, he said, Dave, we're living the life. Drilling wells, thousand barrels a day, they're paying us good, this is it, we're living the life. I said, well, Terry, the only thing better would be leading somebody to Jesus. And he, he pushed his plate in front of him and he said, Dave, what are you doing here? Get out of here. I said, what do you mean get out of here? <laughs> he said, you should be preaching. You should be in ministry. Get out of here. I said, well, I, I, I'll need support. I'll, I, I need the money. He goes, hey, the money will come. Don't worry about that. Go. It interrupted my life. And, uh, and we did. We made some changes. We, started be, we became bivocational, working in ministry and working at a job. And then one day, God tapped on our shoulders and said, hey, I want you to move from Saskatchewan to British Columbia. He interrupted our life the whole family's life, <laughs> and we moved out here. But it wasn't for less, it was for more. And when we moved here, I, I kept a little oil company that I'd started with small wells, and uh, then around 2002, God interrupted my life, and he said, Dave, I want you to sell that company. I said, no, no deal, God, not, 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 not part of the package. That's my retirement plan. We're not selling those. We're going to do infield drilling later on, God. That's what we're doing. And, um, and I would like you to bless that later on. So no, <laughs> we're going to keep that. Uh, and God said, no, no, I want you to sell it. And then it was silent for a while. Have you ever had God speak to you and then he just goes silent? He's just waiting for you to obey. Well, I didn't obey. And, uh, you know, confession is good for the soul, bad for the reputation. So... <laughs> A little while later, my geologist partner calls and says, Dave, uh, we got a problem at 9 32. We got hit by lightning. Very rare that a, that a tank would be hit by lightning. It was venting gas. It got hit by lightning, so we had a nice flame come off the top of that tank. And very expensive to call the fire department to come put out the fire. I said, okay, God, you have my undivided attention. You have interrupted my life. What would you like me to do? I will sell it. But where do I sell it? Who, is, who wants to buy this? The price of oil was low. The next day, somebody calls and said, 
was my operator, Dave, a company in Calgary wants to buy your little company. Would you sell it? I go, okay, God, I surrender. I give it over to you. God interrupted my life. And it was not for less, it was for more. God was interrupting Felix's life. He didn't realize that it would have been for more. He missed his opportunity because it was inconvenient for him. Inconvenience means it's impractical. It's inopportune. It's, 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 it's going to be troublesome. And when God steps into your life, it feels inconvenient. But trust him in his timing. God has the right time for you. And God also sends the messenger. He appointed Paul to come and speak. In Acts 9, verse 15, we read that Paul was appointed to the Gentiles and to go to the kings. Paul was there for the right time. Felix didn't set up this meeting. Paul didn't set up the meeting. God set it up. And sometimes God will set you to be the messenger or he'll send a messenger to you. God has a way of working behind the scenes to set up the right messenger. Thirdly, God appoints the message. And what a message, what a message that Paul brought to Felix, Governor Felix. He's a big deal. I'll put a picture on the screen for you so you get an idea of what it might have been like. This is Felix here, Governor Felix. See him up here? He's 60 years old, so they've made him a young Felix. I think he looked a little older than that. But at any rate, he, he looks good for his age. There's Felix, and this is Trusilla. He's 60, she's 19. His trophy wife. I literally, I mean that his trophy wife. You know why? Because she was already married to some other dude further north to a king. He sent a magician to trick her to come to be his third wife. So he fell in love with her beauty. Her sister Bernice was actually jealous about her. And she ends up here being the wife of Felix. Uh, and, and Felix, he's an interesting character. He's the only fellow who was a slave who went through the system to become a Roman governor. Historians write about him that he acted like a king the heart of a slave. What they meant by that was he had, as a slave, people treat him harshly, so when he got into a position of power, guess what he did? He treated people harshly. So this is, this is Felix. Drusilla. You talk about a family. Wow. Remember, her sister's Bernice. Her brother is Herod Agrippa II. So he's the last one to be called the title Herod. But when you look, <laughs> Sharon and I were talking about this last night, I think there was a generational curse on that family when you look back at what happened. Because her dad was the one who had the apostle James, the disciple James, executed. Remember that earlier in the book of Acts? We talked about him being beheaded. And they throw Peter in jail. And they get, Peter thinks he's next. That was her dad that did that. Quite the story to hear when you're younger. Her, her grandpa? Her grandpa is the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. I don't know if that ran the family, this beheading thing or not, but anyhow, there was a lot of that seems to be going on. And then her, her great-grandpa was the one who had all the children killed when Jesus was born. They were under the age of two. This is her family lineage. This is Trusilla. This is Felix. So Herod, I mean, Paul now in chains, gets before them, and he has to defend himself, and now he's got an opportunity to speak to them. Well, what would you say if you were in his shoes? Now, he, he treats him with courtesy. He says, you know, he, he's very respectful for, to him, and then he reasons with him. Most would have said, they would have talked in generalities, they would say, this is what I believe, blah, 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 but not Paul. Paul is God's messenger with a message. So even Felix, with his reputation, all that he's done, living with his third wife, who's not really his wife, somebody that he's taken as a trophy wife, he speaks to him about righteousness, 
self-control, and judgment. Felix, all due respect, I know you're a big deal. You're a governor. But one day, you will stand before God, and you'll give an account of your life. Felix, there's something called self-control, where you control your desires, your appetite, your sexual desires. You, there's self-control that should be in somebody's life. There's something about righteousness. And we could take Paul's messages from Corinthians or Romans. We could reiterate what he would have been speaking. But he said, your righteousness is not found in your right doings. It's found in the righteousness only in Christ. This is a message that he spoke to him. Now, you would think when he was that bold and that strong, there in chains, that Felix would have said, cut his head off, away with the guy. But he doesn't do that. Felix is trembling. This is a hardened Roman governor. He is, he's had a lot of people killed. That message from Paul was so powerful because the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, rightly dividing between the soul and spirit and joint and marrow as a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And that's what's happening to Felix. His heart is being revealed and he's, he's there on his throne and he's trembling. And what does he say? He could have changed. But he says... Here's exactly what he says. Let me read exactly what he says so I don't get it wrong for you. Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call you. I'll procrastinate on this. God's speaking to me, but I don't want to do this right now. It's not convenient. It's easy for us to look at Felix and say, Felix, you missed it. <laughs> you should have right then and there received that. Do you know sometimes we procrastinate too on God? We say it's not convenient when he's tapping on our shoulder to do something. Maybe he's saying, Saturday morning prayer, it's a good time for you to come together with others and pray. Oh, but that's not convenient. That's my time. <laughs> that's, that's what I sleep in Saturday morning. That's when I, uh, I, I, go, I walk my dog Saturday morning. I, I have my coffee. I, that's just not convenient for me. In the Aramaic, it says that when my conscience is cleared up, you can't clear your own conscience. You need Jesus to forgive you to clear your conscience. He needed forgiveness from Christ. It wasn't convenient. Sometimes we say... Maybe the Lord taps on our shoulders to go to uh, the school of missions. Oh, it's not convenient right now. Maybe he taps on our shoulders. He interrupts us and says, it's time to start a life group. Oh, that's, that's not convenient. Uh, I'd have to do this or do that. It's not convenient for my schedule. God interrupts us. He doesn't have to send you a text and say, hey, but do you have time for a meeting next week? Can you clear your time for this? God's God. So quiet in here this morning. I don't know. I have no idea why. Some of you are wondering, why did I come to church this morning? <laughs> Keep in mind, God loves you. He loved Felix. He loved Paul. It was a message of love. And Paul wasn't preaching strong like this to be arrogant or negative. It was because he really loved people. He loved Felix. He loved Drusilla. And it was a message of change. And we can often miss what God's doing because we want to live for the convenient. We want to be comfortable. Rick Warren had this quote, and I'll go back and put it up for you here. And uh, it says where Rick says, God is more interested in your character than he is in your comfort. God is more interested in making your life holy than is making your life happy. So when he interrupts us and it feels inconvenient, just remember God's more interested in you having good character. I know we live in a world we want to be comfortable. We want things convenient. We want our food to come quicker. We want the right seat on the airplane. We want a cup holder in our car. You name it. <laughs> we want things convenient. God's more interested in your character. He's more interested in holiness than he is in happiness. So he will interrupt our lives. He interrupted Felix. He'll interrupt your life. He'll tap on your shoulder. And it's not always convenient. He interrupted Mary's life. 
He'll interrupt your life. But just know that any time he interrupts your life and says, I'm opening a door for you to do this, now is the time to do it. Because ultimately, there's an appointment that's coming in your life. And God has set it up. It's a day of judgment. The Bible says it's, it's appointed once to die and then comes judgment. And this is what Paul shared with Felix. There's a judgment day coming. Every one of us will stand before God. One-on-one -on -one meeting. It's already in the calendar. It's already booked. You might be saying, well, what day is that? What time is that? He's not telling you. He doesn't have to tell you. He's not telling me. But there's a day coming where I'll stand before God and give an account for my life. Jesus said, every idle word, every idle word you spoke, you'll give an account for it. Paul said, all that you've done, you're going to have your motives tested. Why did you do what you did? If it was for selfish reasons, it's going to go up in smoke. But if you did it with a pure heart, it'll remain. There'll be a reward. So we'll all give an account one day. We read this verse in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. As has just been said, today, today, not tomorrow, not yesterday, today. No procrastination here. Today, if you hear his voice, this little word, if you hear his voice, we can shut out his voice. We can have it go in one ear and out the other ear, or we can listen passively. But he says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. See, every time you procrastinate on God when he asks you to do something, the longer you procrastinate, the harder your heart gets. And if you harden your heart too much, that seed never gets a chance to germinate and produce a hundredfold. In the parable of the banquet, the, the, the owner, the master, had sent out his servants to go invite many people to come. And when he invited them, they came back with excuses because it wasn't convenient. One said, I've got business affairs to take care of. It's not convenient to do this. Another said, I've got some recreation. I want to go test drive my oxen. It's not convenient for me to come. Another said, it's not convenient for me to come because I've got family issues. Those three excuses are still what keep people today. Business, recreation, or family. It's not convenient. At the end of it, the master says, none of them are going to enjoy my supper. Go find the people that want to come. And so we want to respond when God interrupts our lives. Is it convenient? Usually isn't. Wasn't convenient for Felix, but he missed his opportunity. You and I, we don't have to miss that opportunity. Today, if you hear his voice. Today, if you hear his voice. God's speaking to us today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The last time we did any research on this topic, we found that the mortality rate in Canada is still 100%. <laughs> Latest research tells 100%. What does that mean? We're all going to pass away. And then after that, the Bible says, comes judgment. Felix was uncomfortable with that. You know why? He's a big deal. He's a big shot. He wants to be in control. Maybe you think, I, I'm in control. I don't have to give account to anybody. Felix didn't want this because he was in control. He didn't have to give the account to anybody except maybe King Agrippa or, or Nero who called him back. But he was the big deal. When you stand before God and you give an account, he's in control and you're accountable to him. So, oh, pastor, this is so heavy this morning. <laughs> I would be doing you a disfavor if we didn't talk about this. Felix missed his opportunity. And God's going to give you many opportunities in life. Not just for eternity, but he's going to give you opportunities to enjoy his beauty. To enjoy the plan that he has for his life. My encouragement today is every time he, ta he taps on your shoulders and interrupts your life, always know it's never for evil, it's always for good. His plans for you are only for good. Trust him when he interrupts your life, when he inconveniences your little schedule, know that it's for something better. He's a God who absolutely loves you and has something better for you than you could ever dream or imagine. If you've never had him in your life, today is the day to do that. I'm going to invite you to simply pray with me if you're watching online here this morning. Maybe this is your time where he's tapping on your shoulder. And up to now, you said, it's not convenient for me to make this change. What would happen with my friends, family, work, whatever? Today is the day. Don't harden your heart. Ask him to come into your life. Let's pray together.
Dear Heavenly Father, this Sunday morning, I open up my heart. I'm not procrastinating any longer. Today, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Be the guide for my life, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.